people and it's gone on far too long and we but president joe biden has un been unwilling thus far to meet with impacted low-income poor workers aligned with the poor people's campaign and the white house needs to do a hell of a lot better and stop being afraid to meet with poor people if you can meet with CEOs, if you can meet with industry leaders, if you can meet with the military industrial complex, well, you damn sure President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, can meet with poor people in the White House, in the Oval Office, discussing their issues. Joining us right now is Kelly Smith uh, with the Poor People's Campaign uh, out of New York. Kelly, glad to have you. I mean, that exchange right there, when I saw it, told me everything I need to know about the Republican Party and how they feel. They claim they are about the working class. And they literally have these white working class people in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, believing the BS of Donald Trump and the rest of them when all they're doing is literally driving the agenda of the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that exchange is uh, shocking, but not surprising. It's repetitive. It's what we see constantly um, from our elected officials, um, really on both sides of the aisle, often. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was struck in particular that um, Senator Graham, you know, had to immediately point out some relative that is a union worker, is that if that somehow um, validates him or uh, gives him more authenticity, and yet he's not willing to, to meet with or talk to or listen, more importantly, to the workers right in front of him. Um, and yet this is what we see time and time and time again um, from officials. Um, they don't want to be confronted with the, with the folks who can actually present the solutions to the problems, the people who are being impacted and know the solutions and they don't want to meet with them because then they might have to change course on what they're doing. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, and again, it, when you're talking about 140 million low income, uh, poor workers in this country, uh, that is a constituency. And as we're seeing, as we're seeing uh, so many, uh, the, the wealth increase, we're seeing the value and the worth of billionaires greatly increase, and we're seeing the bottom workers, we're seeing it, seeing it, seeing it decrease. You know, I would think President Biden and Vice President Harris would be running to meet with the Poor People's Campaign because that literally can turn the tide in the next election if you're addressing those workers and their issues. Absolutely. And we saw it in the last election. You know, we, d we did a huge mobilization campaign to get out more poor and low income voters who are not being listened to, whose issues aren't being addressed. Um, again, as you, you know, so rightfully pointed out that the 140 million of us, and we know those numbers are only growing, um, we know it's at least 43% of Americans um, and, you know, small upticks in voting among that powerful, powerful group changes elections. And so you would think if nothing for self-serving reasons, they would um, be wanting to reach out and, and talk to us and talk to folks. Uh, and yet there is just hesitancy across the board. You know, we never hear poverty truly talked about. Um, we, we bring people before their committees and before them all the time. And it is so hard to get them to, you know, to, to truly listen to what we have to say and to what, um, our people have to say. Um, and, and, and indeed, I, I want to bring in my, my panel here. Um, um, and, and Larry, I'll start with you, uh, because when we're talking about what is happening, when we talk about, uh, the effort that's being put into place for uh, June 18th. I mean, this is uh, a, a this is a, a rekindling, if you will, or picking up where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. left off with the Poor People's Campaign in 1968. The whole point of that was to bring poor people to the nation's capital to show political leaders to put a face on it. And and I know for a fact, again, look, I talked about frat brother Reverend Barber all the time, our our our, our alpha brother. And the White House has been wanting to meet with him 
individually, but not him and the workers. And he said, no, if you go meet with me, you go meet with the poor folks because you're going to have to look, uh, look and listen to their stories. Yeah, Brother Barber is a man of the people. He's not worried about, you know, just an opportunity to go to the White House and do, and you know, have a press conference and, you know, see it on CNN and some other platforms and hear and cover it. And then that it's forgotten. And it's really important that, you know, the uh, chair of the uh, New York State made a really important point about those who are not being listened to. And like, there's a, they're voters. You know, we don't, you know, we got an election coming up here in, in just a few months. And it's really important that we talk about issues related to poverty. And the problem in the society is that it's criminalized. And let's just be clear about that. You know, we talk about, you know, supporting those who are most in need, whether it comes to health care or, or child care or some of the other issues that are really important. Folks don't want to talk about that. And it's really important that we keep the pressure on people. And, you know, in June, I'll be there at the march because we, we need to make sure the voice, voices of the voiceless are being heard. And, you know, this is, once again, this is, we see another situation in which, you know, the federal government, particularly leaders at the White House, are ignoring the people who, who, who want to be voters. But, you know, like my colleague said, they're not being listened to. And, Ramon, Ramon, let's be clear, this is not new. This has been going on for generations in terms of not listening to, to the working class. The other thing is important in terms of these issues relating to Amazon and unions. Amazon is, an, is a union buster. They've been actively, <laughs> since, it's, since it, the, the company was started, trying to prevent you know, Amazon workers from unionizing. This is a huge victory. And I'm from Philadelphia, which is a big union town, and I recognize how important this victory is. But the White House has to listen to the voices of, of, of you know, those underserved, marginalized populations in, in, our, in our community. And also, like I said, they have to stop trying to be, play it safe and making sure they're inviting, you know, not only just Brother Barber, but, you know, the folks that he's working with uh, throughout the country to bring these issues to the forefront. Um, and, and the reality is, Kelly, I mean, look, low-income workers, they're American citizens. They're voters. And if you're talking about who you're more likely going to turn out, you are more likely to turn out low-income poor workers if you're, pre if you're Democrats than trying to reach conservative suburban white women uh, who, I don't care how hard you try, they ain't voting for you. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the black vote is critical to this Democratic president and this midterm election that's coming up. And we remind our black voters over and over again, go, do your part, go to the polls, make sure that we keep folks, you, you know, that look that vote like us in power. But we're asking, what have you done for us lately? If you won't meet with us to hear our demands, to hear why we want you to continue to serve us, then why should we be motivated to go back into the polls? And so that's something over and over again that this president and this administration, quite frankly, continues to do, is to take our votes for granted. And so I think, you know, this highlighting this story about the Poor People's Campaign, highlighting folks like Chris Smalls, who I think deserves an award for everything that he has done to really reimagine what union unionization looks like in this country. Um, those are the voices that we need to be uplifting, not the voices of our elected officials who have not passed anything, who have not made the economic conditions for working people in this country better. The economic conditions over the last two years have gotten worse because of the pandemic. People, you know, the rich have gotten richer, the poor have gotten poorer. And so there is no greater time than right now to have this conversation about the Poor People's Campaign. There's no greater time than right now to really bring these folks, bring these coalitions to the table to really listen and understand, because these are the same voters that this administration and that this party is going to depend on come November. And if we're unwilling to listen to the base of the people who vote for us or the base of the people who vote for you, why should they turn out in return to help your party stay in office? And so I think that that's something that the Poor People's Campaign will be highlighting um, when they come to Washington in June. And hopefully the administration is thinking about that when they're telling folks no. Kelly, again, um, you would Chris. think they'll be reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. They'll be trying to reach you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you, you would. would. You would think. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Were you, were you? No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. Go ahead, Kelly. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you, you would totally think that they would. 
um, you would think that they would want to hear from their constituents. You would think you would want to hear from their constituents. And yet we know that this is strategic. We know that this is a strategic response. They've been told over and over again. So we know that this is an intentional, um, just like they're trying to stifle the voices of organizers and uh, union workers um, and folks fighting for a union, they're trying to to stifle the, the very powerful voice of poor and low wealth people all across this country. Because they know that, you know, I, they can see the shift is coming and the change is coming. And what they are maybe not fully aware of is that we are not going anywhere. We are getting stronger and we are uniting and we are fighting and we are not gonna sit in our anger and our frustration and allow things to continue as they are when the system is broken. The system is keeping people poor. It is keeping people marginalized, it is keeping people divided, and it is keeping them from voting. Um, and we will be there in force in DC on June 18th. Um, and this will be you know, just the beginning. This is, this is not a day, it's a declaration. We will be saying that we are a force to be reckoned with and you will listen to us and we're not going anywhere. Uh, and, and, and the thing, Greg, for the people out there who are utterly confused, uh, this is not a day of just having a march. No, this is literally an opportunity to speak to the issues, but serve really as the kickoff for the campaign from June going through November. Yes, yes, and again, the importance of black media in general and the importance of the Black Star Network and Roland Martin and Filter in particular. This has been a daily drumbeat of coverage that you've been providing in tandem with the Poor People's Campaign. And I was watching the question and answer the other night and every all the information we need is right here. You know, uh, W.B. Du Bois, when he was addressing the first SNCC, the student, uh, the, the Southern Negro Youth Conference in South Carolina, uh, back in the 30s, he gave a talk entitled Behold the Land. And he said the future of black folk is in the South. But that also extends to the future of poor folk. When we see this uh, this draft opinion that leaked and the white nationalist party is now quiet as a church mouth because it was a little premature. I think they're worried about a potential event horizon. Uh, when we saw that, we know that the people who are going to be affected, the women that are going to be affected are the poor are going to be black and brown women, are going to be women without resources to be able to protect themselves and to even get basic health care. And we see all those forces converge in South Carolina. Uh, Little Lynn Graham is a wholly owned subsidiary of Home Depot and Pfizer and Amazon, who are among his big campaign donors in South Carolina. Over the last decade, we've seen South Carolina expand mightily into South Carolina with uh, their uh, distribution centers, huge tax breaks that the South Carolina legislature controlled by the White Nationalist Party has given them. And to see that brother today, Chris Smalls and his fitted and grills, uh, refer to uh, Lynn Graham as Mr. and not Senator Graham, uh, I like that kind of contempt because that man should be held in contempt. And what we have to understand is that the Poor People's Campaign is, is extending the trajectory of Dr. King, who said over and over again that he was not a politician, that he was called to this work. And they were coming, as we know, and as you've talked about many times, Resurrection City, they were going to come here and stay. This wasn't a one-day event like 1963. They put a bullet in Dr. King, in part to try to slow that movement down. But out of what happened in 1968, we see strong unions. We see civil rights legislation. We see organization. And finally, and this is what I love uh, listening even now, uh, Sister Smith, uh, Kelly, and listening over the nights that you've been covering this, Roland, the level of organization in this Poor People's Campaign is unmatched. I was looking at the bus schedule, the routes that are coming, the uh, the, the ride share buses that are coming from all over the country. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that if you're going to get on one of those buses around the country, you got to get to get the best rate. And the rates are already low, but they say they go up after the 19th of, of May. So make sure you all get the seats. We're all going to meet here in Washington and we're not going to go anywhere. The reason the poor are ignored in this country is because the people who think they can buy elections and break the back of the poor have bought the politicians who are under firm instructions to ignore them. But guess what? You get enough people together and you cannot be ignored. Kelly, final comment. 
Oh, I'm, I'm just so grateful for all the things that are being um, shared here. No, it is absolutely true. We are uh, we are well organized. We are continuing to organize. We are mobilizing. We are across all sectors, all communities. Um, these are so many of us have been called to this movement. It is not just an action or something that we do, but it is a true calling. And we will be coming out in force across every line of intended division. We will be breaking down those lines of division and we will be organizing together. And it is gonna be a mighty, beautiful day um, in DC but it will be a declaration of our force. And then as we've been, as organizers, as we've been saying, and then the work really begins on the 19th. So we just uh, want folks to come out and to join us and to contact their state campaigns. And we have a strong, strong, strong campaign in New York. Um, and we just welcome everyone to join us. Kelly, we sure appreciate it. Thanks so much. Keep the fight up. Thank you. <laughs> And it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent.